I was standing at my kitchen sink, and it was last August, August the 12th. And I leaned over my shoulder. I said, hey, Beth, Pam's house is sold. I see the sign. And uh, we knew it was just a matter of time. Uh, we were talking to Pam and her family that uh, that place was going to sell. I'm like, any little nosy little neighbor, why do they have open houses so you can find out how much your place is worth? That's right. So we, we noticed that their place is sold, and we actually got a chance to walk through the place. And uh, we knew that uh, uh, we wanted to just see what was there, just nosy neighbors that we were. And uh, so we go over there, and uh, Beth is loving the two stone wood-burning fireplaces. Oh, John, can you imagine our kids and stove and Christmas and all the, all the day? I'm like, Beth, they're about to leave the house. We're downsizing. And uh, she says, well, check this out. And we look out, and there's all these south-facing windows, and this is really cool. And then as I start to drift downstairs, I say, hey, Beth, check out the basement. And as we come down these very narrow stairs, we get down to a very damp and very wet basement with water around the drains. And, and we're thinking, wow, this is, this, is not, uh, this is not good. I'm not a contractor, but this doesn't look good. And then we, we drifted upstairs to the top floor, and sure enough, we saw the baseboard heaters. And we knew that it had been a bungalow as well. But uh, once upon a time, someone built on top of it. And uh, we thought, no, no, this isn't the place for us. And we, and we were just curious to know who were the new tenants were going to be. Pam had been a great neighbor. But somewhere in the last uh, 18 months, she had got a, a rescue dog named Roxy. We loved dogs. And uh, it was half hound dog and half, wait for it, pit bull. So, you know, nice is right. So, uh, we, are, we, we love it. So Benjamin's basketball would drift over top of the fence. Uh, she, uh, Roxy would sort of tap into her, I'm um, protecting the kingdom, into her pit bull thing. So there was a part of us we were glad to say, maybe see the dog go, miss the family. And uh, the daughter said, hey, Beth, I know you're a big gardener. Why don't you take our peonies? So there's Beth uh, over there with a the shovel. I'm helping out. And we're taking off these peonies so we can replant them. And so, so we, we know there's going to be a new neighbor. And uh, we see the Flacera sign go up. And then, obviously, now the soul sign is there. So you're going to get the mail. And again, you're just under, you're the undercover, how much is your place worth kind of mode. But you're going to the mail, and you get your mail. And you come and walk by, hey, Pam, I see the place is sold. And she said, yeah, the person who bought it never even walked in the house. It's some Ontario limited company that actually bought it. Oh, OK, thank you. So when you think of that, what do you think? You think it has become what? A ripper. A ripper, and indeed it is. This is the second ripper in the neighborhood with this contractor. So I'm out uh, the next um, week, and I'm in the, uh, walking back by the driveway. And he goes, excuse me, sir. And I turn, and there's this man walking up the drive. He goes, are you the owner here? I said, yes, I am. He goes, guess what? I'm looking to build my dream house right there. And I thought, great. As he says it, just like in slow motion, I'm looking to build my dream house. You're thinking, I'm going to have a construction site next door for eight months or more. This is what you're hearing. And as we watched this new house go up next door, we watched it come down first, and then we watched the excava excavation trucks come through and all the things and dig it all out and take it all away, and countless trucks, off they go. And once it's all settled in, then they start to put in what? They start to put in the footings, and they start to put in the rebarb, and the cement comes, and it's all, and they're trying to establish what? A very strong and firm foundation. Foundation is really important. That's all a setup to say as we look at our passage of Scripture. I want you to turn to the second epistle of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, and uh, we want to spend some time in that book, 2 Peter. If you have it there in front of you or if you've got it on a device, you can just pull it up. And 2 Peter has this idea of the foundation in mind as he's now addressing this group of people who has he already addressed in 1 Peter. But it's a different kind of a focus now in 2 Peter. And if you're thinking about the, these two uh, letters side by side, it is a network of churches. And if the pressure is coming from the outside in 1 Peter, you're going to have opposition, says Peter. You're going to have persecution. And in that, you're going to have suffering. Let my words that I write to you in 1 Peter, let them be an encouragement to you. I want to uh, bring comfort to you. 2 Peter is different. Second Peter, he's simply saying, the pressure now is going to come from within. That is to say that there are going to come among you false teachers who are going to come and they're going to deny that there's actually a second coming. 
that are going to deny that there's a judgment. And so I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you of your foundation. And as I was sitting there listening uh, and worshiping together with you folks, there was a line that took place in the third verse, and I had to script, uh, quickly script, script capture it. And it says this. It says, take me back to where we started. And that's exactly what Peter is saying. Peter is saying in first chapter, if we look there in chapter one, he says to them, I'm about to pass away. I'm going to about to die. He says that up in verses 12, 13, and 14. He says, My, the Lord has said to me, I'm about to die. But I want to not tell you anything new. I simply want to tell you, I want you to remember and I want you to be established in the truth. And the truth is, your faith is your foundation. Now, for the sake of those who are taking notes, I'm trying to be uh, very uh, clear. Not, I want to oversimplify things, but this morning I've got a few little mnemonics that are going to help us stay together. So we're going to camp out in this first verse, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. If, it's gonna, if you can bring it up on the screen there, if that's possible. But we're just going to camp out in one verse and one verse only. Don't you love it when a speaker comes and says, we're just going to cover one verse? Now, at different points, I may reach out and grab a couple other verses from other places, but for the most part, we're going to ask you just to anchor right in here in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, and it is the opening. So here's the very first mnemonic I want you to do. It's called 411, 411. That is the little uh, directory you look up things. So uh, it's become uh, known in the slang world as what's, what's the 411? What's the information on that? Who's heard that before? What's the 411? So the other day, the other day, I was on the back deck, and Annie was back there. And I'm like, Annie, and she's, uh, she's like, hey, what, what do you want to know that? She's this teenager, and, uh, she, and I said, hey, Beth, or hey, hey Annie, wh what's the 411 and what's happening tonight with you and your friends going out? She said, what does that mean? I said, oh, it's a slang. It means, like, what's the information? What's the 411? And she's just on her phone. <laughs> she looks up. She goes, Dad, we don't say that. <laughs> Wait for it. She goes, your people may, but we don't. We don't. <laughs> but, okay, but, but we do. So Peter is simply saying, I want to give you the 411. I want to give you the information on what it is that you have, your faith, your firm foundation. So if you've written that down, if you've captured it on your phone and your notes, it's 411. We're going to go backwards. We're going to pick up number one. We're going to say it is one verse, one foundation, and four word pictures. One, one, one. And I'll throw it in for free. We are in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. So would you turn with me, please, if you're not there already, to 1 Peter chapter, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He starts off and he simply says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Now this verse, first verse that we're going to be camped out on, it is a part A and a part B. Part A simply says, I want you to know what my titles are as I write to you. I want to make sure you understand my credentials and the credentials are for them specifically because he wants to say, I'm coming to you with some authority. But at the same time, he's saying, I am going to tell you that I'm what? I'm two things. I'm a servant and I'm an apostle. And I want to make sure you know that I'm an apostle because I'm going to tell you some things, remind you of some things, because you need to know those things that have come from an apostle because chapter 2 of Second Peter and chapter 3 of 2 Peter has to do with these false teachers coming in and questioning the authority of what uh, Paul, uh, Peter's actually saying. So I want to make sure I establish that. So he simply says in his title, he simply says, I am Simon Peter, comma, here's my title, a servant and apostle. What a great blend of meekness and authority. You think about that in... Old Testament imagery of the shepherd. The shepherd has a very strong that, that uh, rod that he has, and he can you know, do things with the rod, protecting the sheep, but at the same time, there's this tender care. So Peter is simply saying to, you, to them and to, to, to you this morning and to me and to, the, to his audience, he's simply saying, I am both a servant and I am also an apostle. He's got a blend of strength as well as tender, compassionate care. Don't you want that in a leader that has that balance between a servant heart, which is tender, compassionate care, and authority in showing strong leadership? So he says that to them. I am an apostle. Now, it's important that he's an apostle 
Because later he's going to say we're apostles because we've done certain things. We have done certain things. That is to say, we have been witnesses. We were there. Oh, by the way, false teachers, if you question me, I was there. I was an eyewitness to what? What happened at the Mount of Transfiguration. I saw what I saw. And he's going to get to that at the bottom of chapter 1. I saw the transfiguration. That's what I did. I was an eyewitness to that. And he says, and again, I, I slip off to other verses, but he, he simply reminds them that of who we are. We are the apostles. He says there in verse 16, don't turn. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised uh, myths that we made up known to you uh, to the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's who we were. Now, these apostles were very strong individuals because they had been with Christ. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says something on this theme of foundation. And that is, he says, Paul is speaking to us in Ephesians chapter 2, and he simply says this. He says this about the apostles. He says, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. That is the strength of the apostles. We are the ones that the whole foundation of the church has been built on the apostles. And he wants to make sure they understand that. And then he says this. He says, I'm writing to these folks. I'm writing to these people. He says, to those. Now, I wish you could just follow with me. I wish I could just drift over there. And if I would have had a big whiteboard, I would start over there. And I would just write out on one long line the second part of verse 1. Because it says this, and let my arm do the talking. Over here on the far right, uh, my far right side, it says, to those, and there's no comma, but I want to describe the those. To those, comma, who have obtained a faith which is of equal standing with ours by the knowledge and righteousness of God. Is it up there yet? There it is, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ run straight across. And for the balance of our time, we're simply going to move across those simple words and say, this is the strength of what Peter says. Remember your foundation. And your foundation is faith. He says this. He says, to those who have obtained a faith. What have you done? You have obtained a faith. It was a gift. You received a faith. You don't work for it. You didn't do anything to get it. You obtained it. It was a free gift, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So you've received something. What have you received? It's a faith. It's a subjective decision that you made that you would put your trust in Christ, or it's an objective deposit of all the truth, your faith, all the deposits that are made about Christ, the gospel. So if you can imagine, back to my little opening analogy, where that big cement truck is coming and depositing all that cement on top of the rebar and everything else through the, for the footings to make sure it's really a strong foundation. It's almost like all the uh, truths of God are just being poured into that foundation. And we referenced it this morning. As Gary said, we're talking about the communion. And sometimes we just take our faith like it's the, the tip of your nose. It's there, but you never quite think about it until once a month when you think about communion. So what is our faith? What is into that faith that is there. And that's when the four word pictures come in. This faith is there and it is built and it is strong because it happened by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Some key words that are there. First key word would be by or through or in. So our faith came to us by or through or in him, and it happened because of the righteousness of Christ. Remember, he's the perfect one, the perfect sacrifice, who is our God, and not, he's just not our God. He is our Savior, Jesus Christ. Of all the different descriptions that Peter could choose to describe this first chapter in this first verse, he says, I have a whole word bank I can choose. Let me describe Jesus this way. I could describe him as our Lord. I could describe him as this. Or I could describe him as that. He goes, no, 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 no. I got a good one. I'm going to describe him as our Savior. He's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, there are four word pictures that come to mind when we talk about Savior. Now, let me pause and just say something as a disclaimer. Lastrous. 
What I'm about to do is I'm going to take these glorious truths, these great promises, these precious promises to describe what happened by Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, and I'm going to bring it down to four pictures. My purpose is not to simplify this and make it so simple and, and somehow diminish what Christ did on the cross. One communicator who I like to listen to said one time, he says, I'm not trying to be simple when I break things down. I simply want to be what? I want to be clear. I want to take the tip of your nose and make it clear to say, this is what happened. When we took the communion, what happened at that moment, when Peter says, remember, when Paul says, remember, I want you to remember something. I want you to remember in these four word pictures. And the four word pictures represent, to put it in the language of today, there's a drug intervention. There's an intervention that happened. It was an incredible intervention. Christ on the cross did four incredible achievements for us. And they're all represented in four images. And I keep saying that. I Tell us the four images already. Uh, so the first one is a home. No, the first one actually, let's look them up. The first one's a marketplace. That's a place where transactions are taking place. The second one is an altar. The third is a home. And the fourth one is going to take place in the court of law. And they all are going to be involved with what we have at the front of our churches. We have on top of our churches. We wear them around our necks. It's an actual cross. But that symbol of death, that that when Christ intervened and took all our sin upon himself, that happened at the cross. Pause. Isn't it kind of a strange thing to think about? Imagine someone from 2,000 years ago walked through our doors, and we were talking about this idea of the cross. And they had been just recently on social media, this person from 2,000 years ago, scratching their head, thinking, what has become to the symbol of death? What is this electric chair, this lethal ejection, where he's now seeing this image, our present day <laughs> images of symbols of death, that the, the cross has become something, as I've been on social media, he says, I see what? I see the rappers have changed with the symbol dangling on them. I see hip-hop artists who have tattoos with the symbol of death. I see country singers with a big old belt buckle with a cross. We give it as a gift. That symbol of death was truly an important intervention, a moment. And if you want to do it, and Gary mentioned, thank you very much, I am a reverend. That means I can use these big words. Here comes word number one. Ready? Want to write it down? That intervention was called the atonement. Atonement. Or, simply put, at one, at one. That is to say, when we're talking about being saved, he's the savior, we are being, and here's my little this side and that side, we are being saved from something and we're being saved to something. So this side is what our human condition is. We are in a desperate place. We need to be saved. Our human need, our reality is here. We're gonna be saved from here and we're gonna be saved to something. And when we're saved to something, we're actually going to make this declaration over you. And this atonement, this at one, we were separated from God and God has brought us back. We are now at one. And that's what happened. And it happened at the cross. And at the cross, there was blood. It was through his blood. Through his blood. Let's check out this, see if we have this screen here. Go ahead, the next uh, slide. So this, and I try, again, trying to not be gimmicky. I'm just trying to make it memorable. What were you saved from? That is to say, this atonement, wait for it now, was so far, not misspelled on purpose, or misspelled on purpose, so far reaching. It had such imp incredible impacts because the forward pictures are that we were saved from this and we were declared free. We were saved from something and we were declared accepted. We were saved from something and we were de de declared restored. We were declared. Uh, we were saved from something, and we were declared reconciled. Uh, uh, what is it? Righteous. There it is. So let's look at those forward pictures. Let's look at them. Number one, it's the marketplace. It's like the New Testament writer said, let me describe to you the atonement. And you tell it to somebody, and they go, you know, I don't quite, what was that about? What happened there? 
I'm not just quite sure. And all of a sudden, the writer goes, okay, 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 okay. In other words, it's like this. It's like a marketplace. Think of a marketplace. Think of a place like this where you actually go and there's a transaction of goods and services. And you hear it in your hymns and your songs and your choruses. What? He paid my debt. I am no longer in debt. He, he paid that. And it's the idea of the marketplace. And the key, big key word out of that would be redemption. He actually redeemed us. Because over here, we were in bondage. We were in captive. We were captive to sin. You've heard that all the time. We are bondage to sin. We are captive to sin. That's our condition. And we've been saved from this. And because of the redemption that took place by the cross, we actually have been declared free. There's a verse in Ephesians chapter 1 that says, we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins through his blood according to his great and mighty riches. That redemption came to us because of his blood through him and that grace that he has. So the writer says that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and explains that to someone. And someone goes, you know, you know what? I, don't, I still don't quite get it. And then the author says, okay, 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 okay. How about a second word picture? How about the second word picture isn't going to be a marketplace? No, no, no. How about we actually, this is going to be a hard one for this crowd, he says, because, you know, it's 2,000 years later. We don't have this sort of, these rituals so much anymore. Like, we don't have these big altars or these big shrines. Pause. But today, you go to places in Asia and other places, you actually see in houses, there's actually a shrine, an altar. So if we're going to talk about the marketplace and the language of the marketplace is all about transactions and a ledger. No, no, no. Apparently that didn't quite work. Let's look at it now in terms of a place of rituals and altars and a shrine. And it says, okay, this is the one where over here, the wrath of God was on us. And you keep reading that, that, all the different places in the Bible. The wrath of God is on us. And because of the blood of Christ, what he did, his sacrifice on that altar, because of that, we were saved from this condition and we were saved to something and we were declared as a result of the sacrifice, we were declared accepted. That the wrath of God, and you've heard that big word, it was appeased, it was paid. The wrath of God. Paid, Jesus paid our, our ransom, or he endured the, the weight of God's wrath, and we were declared accepted. And the passage of Scripture you can look at is Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Now you have this word, and I wait for it, sit back, take it all in. If redemption was the key word for the first image, it's that second one that's going to be a hard one to maybe even spell. Ready? propitiation. But the simple thought is, it's a sacrifice. That sacrifice actually did what? The wrath of God upon us was absorbed, was taken in by Christ on the cross, and we are now declared accepted. A teenager growing up, whatever, one of the big songs, I was, you were condemned, I was accepted, you know, that kind of back and forth, and that you hear that all the time. Again, uh, once you kind of think of these things, you start to Pick up different words that you've heard in, 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 in Scripture as well as in hymns. So if we talk about redemption as the first word picture, that, we, that in that moment something happened, then we say that the second one is propitiation, that something actually the wrath of God was appeased and that we are accepted. The third word picture, and it's a big one, it talks about the word picture is the home. I don't quite understand the language of transactions Word picture number one. I don't quite understand the language of rituals. And Okay, okay, okay. How about this one? You all have relationships that you're in. Let's choose the home. One of the things that, um, as a married man, I can say, uh, and married people in the crowd can get this as well, there's something that happens inside the home. Okay, it's just, it's just really cold. There's, just, there's a freezing that goes on when husband and wife are not talking to each other. And in church world, sometimes you go, we're out of fellowship. We're out of fellowship. Back, let's go back to the teenagers in the bungalow going, um, mom and dad are mad at each other. <laughs> like they're, they're not talking or whatever. And you could just tell. And sometimes you could just tell that you're out of fellowship. And when you're not quite there, things sound louder. 
Like you get in the cup of coffee and you need some sugar. And it's like, and there's just these sounds that are happening in the home because you are out of fellowship. And then at some point you get back into fellowship and, it, and, and the house gets a little quieter. Overstate that. We've been in relationships, whether it's in business or in the home or other things. And as a nation, it's the big key word that you talk about. It starts with our reconciliation. That is to say, in this context of what Christ did at the atonement, we're over here. Our human need is that we are what? We are separated from God. We are estranged from God. The relationship with God is broken. And Christ came as a result of the atonement. He did what? He declared us, declared the relationship restored. We are restored. We now have, and here's the other big key word, we now have peace with God. Peace with God. And a key verse for that would be Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Where Paul writes there, he says, now we have what? We have the reconciliation by the blood of Christ. We now have peace with one another. And you're explaining this. I want to explain it to you in the marketplace. It's all about transaction language. I don't, I don't quite get that. Okay, how about this? How about I explain it to you in the language of the rituals of a temple and a shrine? No, no, I didn't quite get what that looked like. How about the home? All the experiences that happen inside the home. I don't quite know what you're talking about there. The fourth and final word picture comes to us, and it's in a court of law. And you've got the gavel. And this is one that you probably hear often if you've kind of been up in church world, growing up in church world, you talk about the judge. And the judge says to you over here, this is your human need. This is your reality. I'm going to save you from this human reality. That is, you are a guilty person. There is guilt there. And as a result of what Christ did for us on the atonement, that intervention, that moment, he saved you from your guilt, and what? He actually declared you righteous. It was, and again, a big word, it was imputed to you. It was given to you. The righteousness of Christ was put on to you. That language is there. And this whole one right here, under the idea of this last word picture, which is the court of law, is the big doctrinal description of justification. Justification. We're justified. Justified. And we have that in Romans chapter 5. Again, Paul describing Therefore, since we have been justified, always have to have this little phrase, through his blood, we are now declared righteous. This atonement, this firm foundation, this faith that you are standing on is so far-reaching because you have been declared free, accepted, restored, and righteous. You have. You have been. And you need to know that because that is your position. I want to give you the confidence, says Peter. That's your confidence. I'm writing, says Peter, to those who have obtained, received, free gift, a faith of equal standing as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. A couple of thoughts before we close. This statement right in here, of equal standing with ours. That's a pretty, pretty important statement to make. And if you really said to Peter, do you, do you really mean that you, Peter, with the chosen series on Netflix, product placement, if it's anything, that Peter, who would go on to become the Apostle Peter and do all these incredible things, that same Peter would say to those who have obtained the faith that that faith is what? Of equal standing with ours. 
Can you imagine receiving that as a letter? And in their minds, they have this idea that that generation of the apostles are dying out, literally dying out. And by this point, in about 68 AD, when Nero is doing his uh, vicious thing, Peter's about to die. And they get this letter that says, I want to make something clear to you. Yes, I'm about to die. I want you to remember some key truths. But remember something. What you experienced, that same faith you have, it's the same faith as ours. We received it the same way. Be encouraged in that. Lean into that. That even though I die, the church will grow. That faith will continue to grow. And you need to stay and step into it and lean on it. And it is strong. Now, when I mentioned to you about a foundation, our neighbor next door puts in this new house. Uh, and it's almost done. And uh, not that we're going to take a little field trip and drive down my street. But if you come in from this side of uh, the neighborhood, um, and you see, and our house is here, and then his house is right there. It, our house kind of looks like, um, like the guard shack of this big, big, and someone called it a McMansion. And uh, it's a bit of a tourist attraction where Beth and I are sitting out on the porch or something. You see people walking by with the stroller kids. Hey, kids, look. Wow, it's really big, Daddy. And they look way up like that, and it's just a big, a, a big, uh, a big structure that's there. But it is built on a firm foundation. And uh, Alex, the contractor, he gets started. And uh, then the cold weather comes, and he puts these big tarps on it. In fact, he put it on Christmas Eve. He just got it in time, put all the tarps on it, and says it's too cold. We'll start again in March, April. And so uh, it's sat with that firm foundation that's there. And my desire is when I come back next week, Lord willing, when they come back, this firm foundation, we're going to put the tarp on it. So you make sure you understand the foundation, because next week, Peter's going to continue. It's not a one-verse book of the Bible. In verse 5, he says something quite dramatic. After, you've since, after he said, you've obtained something, as in without peace, he says, supplement your faith. Do we have to work for our faith? Supplement? What do you mean talking about, Peter? Add to your faith. What exactly are we going to add to our faith? And that is the structure. That is... What are you going to now build upon that foundation? And next week's sermon, message is to be called either you're what? You're growing or you're slowing. How's that, eh? It's not my own. I got it off the internet. S growing or slowing. And it doesn't matter what, how old you are. <laughs> you're growing or you're slowing. That is, you're building on that strong foundation. Now, if you think about a foundation... And I asked you, what sort of world-famous tourist attraction comes to mind when I talk about a foundation? The picture would be what? Put your hand up if that was where you got your kind of mind went. Right? The idea of the faith that is built in a firm foundation, this is an easy sort of uh, image to go to. Way back when, this place it was actually just known as the Tower of Pisa. They didn't say, let's build the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It is famous for one reason. It's not famous because of its height. It's not famous because of its architecture. It's famous for one reason. It leans. It leans. And if you do a bit of a deep dive on what happened with the Leaning Tower of Pisa, apparently by the second floor when they were building it, they kind of knew there were going to be some trouble with it. And they took a little bit of time out. And then they decided, let's just keep building. And they did. And they built it. And when it was completed to where it is today, it has now off the plumb line, there's a good contractor word, off the plumb line, it has actually leaned five meters off the line. And they have taken engineers, all these heavy weights, and they're actually attached to the back side of the tower so that it kind of holds it there in place. And they only allow a certain amount of people in to visit. You can go in and visit, but 
with power. So the simple question today would be, where are you at with your faith? Do you and can you say that it is on a firm foundation? Because Peter says to this church, I want you to be established in the truth. I want it to be firm. I want it to be anchored. I want it to be rooted in a firm foundation because it's on that foundation you can actually begin to build. So if this is sort of the gimmicky, touristy kind of picture you go to, the Tower of Pisa, where does your mind go in the New Testament when we talk about building a firm foundation? It's a parable. Matthew chapter 7. Sermon on the Mount. The solid ground, the solid foundation are on the sand. Where are you going to build your foundation? Let's pray together. Father God, we are grateful that your truth is before us. We can open it up. And uh, in this passage of 2 Peter, we never got there. But it comes at the end of 2 Peter chapter 1. It says that these words that came did not come by human inspiration. But it actually came by the Spirit of God moving in people to write the actual words of God. And we thank you. Thank you for that truth of your word that there is a foundation that was achieved for us that we celebrate by communion in the atonement by your blood that we are declared free and accepted, restored and righteous. And for that, we are grateful. And may the parable of Matthew chapter 7 and that Sermon on the Mount be the truth for us, that we would continue to build on that firm foundation so that when the storms come, that that foundation and that faith will continue to remain strong. We pray to that end. We know we don't do it alone. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who teaches us into your truth. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that message. Um, before the service, I was brought to Psalm 118, and I had no idea why, and I didn't understand, but uh, verses 22 and 24 says, The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. And verse 24 is a well-known verse, and it says, This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we're going to sing a song, and it's we're singing Here I Am to Worship. And this is a weird song to end the service with, but it was so cool to see the Lord connect the dots through the service because we worship, and but through worshiping, we are building the foundation. That is one way that we can build a foundation. And so as we leave this place, we're preparing to leave this place. Let us develop that heart of worship. Take our heart of worship, not just here. We don't just worship here. We worship as we go. And, and so I pray that... As we, as we close out this service, that we would just be worshiping the Lord together. And I also think it's so cool that the bridge of this song says, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So I love when the Lord connects the dots. So let's worship together.
well. Last week when we met and Dr. Warren Reeves spoke, he gave us a challenge. Does anyone remember what that challenge was? Pray for someone. Listen to them and love them. I just encourage you, if there's someone that you've been praying for and listening to and you get an opportunity to love them, will you send me an email? What we want to do is we want to have a bunch of, he doesn't know this, but when he comes back the last Sunday of July, we want to have a list of stories that we can share with him of how we've been loving and praying and listening and loving people. Okay? Now, homework for this week. John doesn't know this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. Memorize that this week. 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 to 8, because those are what John's going to speak on next week. Here's my promise. You memorize th those verses this week, and when he preaches next week, you will be right in step with him, and you will never forget his message. He hasn't even preached it yet. I don't know if it's going to be a good message or an average message, but if they memorize verses 5 to 8 ahead of time, I promise you'll never forget that message. All right? So another challenge, another Sunday in the summer, and another challenge. Are you up for the challenge, church? All right. Friends, go in the love of God our Father. Go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And go in the fellowship of His Spirit who lives in you and works through you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's worship the Lord together. So here